So I'm a pretty good guy. I'm pretty well liked around the office here. Uh, I'll tell you, that guy over there, he is the biggest gossip. He's always talking smack about people. Everyone likes him for it. Oh, it's the most disgusting thing ever. Oh, can you imagine? No, I think that gossip is a really loaded term. In fact, it's kind of dated. Uh, I really just think of it more as sharing our opinions about other people's life choices. You know, that's completely harmless, right? I don't really think he's a bad guy. He's not trying to be malicious or anything, but he does love his stuff, and he really likes to talk to you about it. Yes, yeah, so when I had the guy drop the Hemi in, he said it would safely tow my 25-foot yacht. That doesn't sound safe at all. No, I, I don't really think I'm greedy at all. I mean, most people would say I'm pretty generous. I just, I deserve a little bit more than most people, you know. Yeah, no, that, that's fine. Just keep watering them. Yeah, I, I know we're in a drought. Yeah, but my cactuses need water, okay? They're desert plants. They need a lot of water. Duh. I don't think he actually knows how little he does around here. Apathy? Uh, no, I'm not even familiar with the term. Oh, oh lazy. I don't think I'm really lazy. Uh, I think I'm just really just waiting for the Holy Spirit to move me. Well, the nice part is that I'm actually kind of good with it and he seems to be good with it. So, you know, I'm good with it. Well, he keeps his hands in my snack pack. Welcome everybody to week number one of our new series titled Acceptable Sins. If you're joining us today from the loft, we're glad to have you guys with us. Or if you're somewhere around the world on the internet watching, thank you so much for taking time to spend with us today. Now all throughout the scriptures and you're reading through the Bible, you'll find God frequently saying, don't. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do the other thing. And when God says don't, so often what he means is don't hurt yourself. But see, we live in a day today where there are a whole lot of Christians who've turned it all around and they take where God says don't and they turn it around and they say, ah, don't worry about it. No big deal. And the result is you know, just countless Christians experiencing the pain of a life that God never intended. And so our goal in this series is to address some of the most common so-called acceptable sins that are afflicting Christians today. And so today I want to talk to you about silencing, shh, silencing gossip. If you have a Bible, turn to Proverbs chapter 6. We're going to be in the Old Testament today, Proverbs 6. If you don't have a Bible, we'll have everything on the screen so we can move through the message together. If you want to challenge you to take some notes on so the seat back in front of you, paper and pen, feel free to use that. Or if you have the smartphone and the Version Bible app, look up the live event, Colonial Church, and our notes are there. So we begin today. I'm curious how many of you enjoy going to the zoo. Can I see your hand? Go to the zoo. Love the zoo. I love the zoo. Whenever we travel and go to a different city, one of the things we'll do is we'll try to get to the zoo because we love it. And my favorite thing about the zoo is the primate house. I feel like I'm coming home, like a family reunion, coming to the primate house. There's just something about gorillas and, and monkeys and chimpanzees. I just find them amazing. I think they're amusing. Now, how many of you have ever been to the zoo and you see a monkey like, wouldn't it be cool? to take a monkey home. You ever, you ever felt that way? Like, wouldn't it be awesome to have your own monkey? Well, I want to share with you a true story about a woman who did, in fact, have a chimp that she raised in her home. We'll put this on the screen so you can see the pictures of what I'm talking about. True story. Sandra Harold of Sanford, Connecticut, took a chimp named Travis into her home. And so for years, she raised Travis as though he were a son. But February 16, 2009, Travis, the chimp, attacked Sandra Harold's 55-year-old friend, Charla Nash inflicting devastating injuries on her face and to her limbs. The chilling 911 call recorded the voice of Mrs. Harold shouting out, he's eating her, he's eating her, while the chimp attacked her dear friend. The 911 call also recorded the sound of police officers shooting Travis the chimp to death. Charla Nash, the victim, lost her hands, she lost her face, first ever transplant of a face in history. She lost her eyes and she's blinded for life. Sandra Harold, the owner of the chimp lost a $10 million lawsuit and died 15 months later due to illness of the stress just destroying 
her body from this crazy incident that occurred. Upon her death, Sandra Harold's attorney released this statement and he concluded, quote, in the end, her heart, which had been broken so many times, could take no more. What's the lesson? Here's the lesson. If you try to make a pet out of a wild animal, you will experience pain. You will experience loss. You will experience regret and heartache. Now, here's the reality. The reality is that very few of us would ever do that, right? Very few of us would ever, like, want to make a pet out of a wild animal. Few of us would do that, but here's the truth. The truth is many of us take a pet into our home far more dangerous than a chimpanzee or a wild animal. Many of us take into our own home a wild pet of just sinful actions. We just take them home, and we just got these little sins. We just feed them. It's like a pet, and it's no big deal without realizing. If you, in fact, try to make a pet out of some kind of sinful action, it's a matter of time. And you will experience pain. You will experience loss. You will experience heartache. So, man, what in the world are we talking about? We are talking about a, just a reality that we will call acceptable sins. There are a whole lot of Christians that just have these pet sins they bring into their life, and they're just like totally okay with them. So what are acceptable sins? I just want to give you a little description. Here's acceptable sin. A little description we put together, put it on the screen so you can see what we're talking about. Acceptable sins is the pain-filled pattern of living that happens when Christians give themselves permission to practice what God forbids. Be very careful what you give yourself permission to do. Because sometimes we give ourselves permission to practice stuff God forbids, and the result is a pain filled. So many of us are wondering why our Jesus thing isn't working. Why is they're so frustrated? Why they're so. And here it is. We keep these little pet things in our lives and we feed them. So, everybody help me out. True or false? Nice and loud. True or false? God says, Thou shalt not murder. True or false? How many of you, by show of hands, feeling like a Christian who murders? No big deal. Can I see your hands? Not very many. We see, oh, Jim, that's an easy one, right? That's an easy one. I think for many Christians, we look at big sins, we think big deal. Then we turn right around and we think small sins, no big deal. And here's the reality. There's no such thing as a small sin. That's no big deal. Philosopher and theologian Cornelius Plantinga wrote a phenomenal little book. I recommend it to you. It's called Not the Way It's Supposed to Be. It's a breviary on sin. And here's what he said, quote, The awareness of sin, a deep awareness of disobedience and painful confession of sin used to be our shadow. Christians hated sin. They feared it. They fled from it. And they grieved over it. Some of our forefathers agonized over their sins. A man who lost his temper might wonder if he could still go to Holy Communion. And he concludes, That shadow has dimmed. Now listen, I'll be perfectly honest with you today. If sin is no big deal to you, then God is no big deal to you. Because God is the one who says that sin is a big deal. And we can't be like, oh, God's a big deal. Sin isn't a big deal. That's, that dog won't hunt. If sin is no big deal to you, then listen, God's no big deal to you because he's the one who says that it's a big deal. And so we're going to spend this whole month, we're going to take four weeks, we're going to look at this and just get an honest look of what's, what's holding us back, what's hurting so many of us. They're called acceptable sins. So here's where we're going to begin today. If you're taking notes, here's our big idea. You can write this down. Here it is. Until you hate what God hates, you'll never enjoy what God enjoys. Until you hate what God hates, you will never enjoy what God enjoys. By show of hands, how many of you agree with this statement? God is a God of love. Can you see your hands? By show of hands, how many agree with this statement? God is a God of hate. Can you see your hands? Not so much, huh? We have a hard time reconciling the concept of God who loves and God who hates. Listen, how many of you are parents? Can you see your hands? Right? Parents? Any parent who loves their child hates the cancer that is diminishing and destroying and even killing their child. True or false? It's true. God is both a God of love and a God of hate. Not in a way that you think. He loves and he hates. 
So I think there's some facts we need to get on the table as we begin. Here's the first one, fact number one. God calls his people to hate what he hates. If you consider yourself a Christian, you have to hate what God hates. Now here's a newsflash. God don't hate people. You can't go, it's them. That guy. No, God doesn't hate people. Here's a Bible verse. Let me give you a bunch of them today. Write them down. It's your responsibility as a follower of Jesus to learn this stuff. Romans 12, 9. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. God hates evil. But there are many Christians who say, have it the other way around. We hate what is good because it's kind of hard and in the way. But we cling to what is evil because it feels good in the moment. We've turned it all around. If you're a Christian, God has called you to hate what he hates. What does God hate? God hates evil. Second thing, second fact, Jesus taught his followers to hate the evil that lives in us first and foremost. Hate the evil that lives in me first and foremost. Matthew 5, 29, Jesus said, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and throw it away. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. Hate the evil in you before you ever hate any evil anywhere else. takes me to fact number three. And for some of you, it's going to blow your mind. Here it is. The key to enjoying God's presence in your life is hating sin's presence in your life. I know this sounds weird, but if you're comfy with sin, forget the presence of God in your life. Forget the closeness of God. The key to closeness and experiencing the presence of God in our lives is hating the presence of sin, understanding the presence of sin in our lives. As Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, a famous preacher in England of a generation ago, who did some study on revivals when God just pours himself into his people in powerful and amazing life-changing ways. And here's a summary, quote, go and read the history of revivals. Never has there been a revival, but that some of the people have had such visions of the holiness of God and the sinfulness of sin that they scarcely knew what to do with themselves. Listen, you want to get close to God, you got to understand the reality of sin. It is not a pet. It will kill you. It will destroy you. It will keep away from you every good thing that God has for you. Now, we're not talking about, okay, be perfect. I'm talking about pets. Perfect and pets are different. Be very honest, there are many of us, we're feeding some pets. We're going to talk about them all month. And these pets will turn on you. And what we need more than anything, if you really want to come alive in Christ, you really want to have all that God desires for you, we must get a fresh vision of, of the holiness of God and the sinfulness of sin. He's called the Holy Spirit. So that's what we're going to see today in Proverbs chapter 6. Before we jump in, a little bit of background is in order. I think Proverbs is a great book. Proverbs gives us, um, it's, it's part of what is known as the wisdom literature in the Old Testament. Wisdom literature meaning like Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, uh, Psalms and Job fit under there. And the goal of wisdom literature is for you to live the life that God intended. It's like God created everything. Here's how life works. If you live according and walk according to the way God made life to work, it'll work for you. In fact, shorthand, wisdom is skillful living, living according to the way God meant for things to be. And in Proverbs 6, there's some warnings that go out to us about ways that we can damage our own lives. And so he warns, uh, Solomon, the, the author warns about money can damage our lives, uh, Proverbs 6, 1 through 5. Laziness can damage our lives, Proverbs 6, 6 through 11. Lust can damage our lives, Proverbs 6, 20 to 25. And gossip can damage our lives, Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. So what is gossip? We're going to put it up on the screen. Here's a, here's a basic definition that we can work with today for gossip. Here it is. Gossip is selective speech about another person's shortcomings in order to harm their reputation. Notice it's selective speech. It's never the whole story. It's just part of a story. And notice it's negative speech. It's about other people's shortcomings, their faults, their failures, their flaws. And notice it's destructive speech. The goal is to harm their reputation. This is gossip. I think it's interesting. In the Old Testament, there's a hero in the Bible. His name is Samson. And the scripture says, Samson slew a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of an ass. And I think many of us have done just as much damage with the same weapon. With the jawbone of an ass. When it comes, listen, when it comes to gossip, here's the spoiler. 
God hates it. No joke. God hates it. We're going to look into this amazing text in the Old Testament. We're just going to see God hates it. So the question becomes, why does God hate it? Like, what's that all about? How, how does this work? Why does God hate gossip? So if you're taking notes, you can write this down. Why God hates gossip, number one, write this down. God hates gossip because gossip disgusts God. Gossip disgusts God. Now I'm curious, how many of you would admit that you have, in fact, had someone gossip about you? Can I see your hands? How many of you enjoyed the experience? It was a good thing. Not at all. It's, it, when, when you find out that someone's been saying things about you to harm you, it makes you sick. Your stomach, you're like, really? It's like, it's horrible. Now, here's the weird thing. We hate it when someone gossips about us, but we love it when someone gossips to us. There's something about gossip. We're like, oh, really? Tell me. We hate it when it happens to us or about us, but we love it when it happens to us. Alice Roosevelt Longworth was Teddy Roosevelt's daughter. She put it this way. She said, quote, if you can't say something good about someone, then come sit right here by me. <laughs> it's a lot of people. We hate being gossiped about. We love being gossiped too. Now listen, there are a lot of Christians today that are totally okay with gossip. You go, who are they? You know who they are. They talk to you. And you're like, they're totally okay with God. Listen, God is not okay with gospel. In fact, I don't know if there's a way to get farther from okay than what we're going to read in Proverbs 6. Let's jump in. Proverbs 6, we'll begin in verse 16. Proverbs 6, 16 says that there are six things that the Lord, what? Hates. Wow, God hates. He's a hater. Interesting. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. I'm going to draw your attention to that word abomination, okay? Abomina now, I admit, I am not the sharpest knife in the drawer. But I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm just going to make a hunch. I think the word abomination is probably not good. I think it's probably not okay. The term abomination in Hebrew comes from a root, to'eba. To'eba literally means, quote, a disgusting thing. That's not good. One biblical scholar defines this, you know, abomination, to'eba. It's that which is wrong in and of itself. And it's recognized by the feelings of outrage that it engenders. In fact, it's kind of interesting. You see that it says that there are six things God hates, seven that are an abomination. Now, this is a rhetorical device, six and seven. It's a poetic ladder, a numerical ladder, and it's basically, it's a poetic device designed to build to a, to, to teach us truth simply and easily to remember, but to also to build to a climax so that we would see that the seventh thing is the worst of all. So here's a list. It's not meant to be exhaustive, but the seventh one is the worst. So there are six things God hates, seven that he finds utterly disgusting. So the question is, what does God find disgusting? Well, here's a spoiler. <laughs> Gossip and those who do it. How many of you like Chinese food, right? Can't get good Chinese in this town, I'm sorry. We can maybe go in on a business. One of the things that Chinese food has is sweet and sour. God, my friends, is sweet and sour. He's sweet on you. He's sour on sin. He's sweet on you. And he is sour on your gossip. He's sweet on me. But he's sour on my gossip. He is both sweet and he's sour. But here's the question. Why is God so sour? Like, why, is he, why gossip? Why does he target that? Well, there's a journalist. His name is Morgan Blake, and he writes for the Atlanta Journal. We're answering the question, why is God so sour about gossip? Well, listen to Morgan Blake. Quote, I am more deadly than a screaming shell from a howitzer. I am tear down homes. I break hearts. I wreck lives. I travel on the wings of the wind. I have no regard for truth. I have no respect for justice. I have no mercy for the defenseless. My victims are as numerous as the sands of the sea and often as innocent. I never forget and I seldom forgive. My name is gossip. Listen, because God loves you, God hates gossip because gossip hurts you. Simple math? Indeed. So the question becomes, 
why does it disgust God? And I think two things jump out to us from Proverbs 6, two reasons why gossip disgusts God. The first one, you can write this down. The first one is its root is arrogance. Its root is arrogance. We see this in verse 17, Proverbs 6, 17. What does God hate? God hates haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. Notice that word haughty right there. In the Hebrew, it literally means high, lifted up, raised up, something that's exalting itself, haughty. I'm curious, how many of you, by show of hands, uh, love to hang out with um, arrogant people? Can you see your hands? Uh, neither does God. He just doesn't dig arrogant people. Now, here's the truth. Some people, here's just how it works. Some people have a sagging sense of self. It could be insecurity, it could be a million things. How do you prop up a sagging sense of self? Most people, by bringing other people down. That's how it's done. Hard to raise, it's just easier to open my mouth and run other people down. That's a way to be, to lift up a sagging sense of self. And notice how it works. It works with our words. Haughty eyes, lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. Follow the flow there. Haughty eyes, lying tongue, hands that shed innocent. How do hands shed innocent? Here's how. Haughty eyes, lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. That's how it's done. That's how it works. Lifting ourselves up by putting other people down will always, always, always result in pain. When I was a little kid, one time I was playing on the playground with another kid, and we were playing on a seesaw. I mean, you like seesaw? I love seesaw. And we were going up and down and up and down. And every time I would jump real high, I would say, I'm higher than you. <laughs> and I'd go up, and we come back down, and I kept doing it over and over. I'm higher than you. I'm higher than you. And guess what the other guy did? He jumped off when I was on my way down. <laughs> on the way down, he jumped off. Guess what happened to me? Bang! I crashed down right on my little arrogance. And he walked away and he said, yep, you win. And I sat there thinking, I don't feel like a winner. Listen, behind a gossiping mouth is an arrogant attitude that tries to put itself up by putting others down, like on a seesaw. Listen, if we know anything about the Bible, we know that God opposes the proud. He'll get off that ride, and he will let you come crashing down on your blessed arrogance. Behind gossip, there's an arrogance of trying to prop myself up. Its root is arrogance. That's why it disgusts God. Here's the second thing. Its heart is devious. Notice that in verse 18, Proverbs 6, 18. What does God hate? God hates a heart that devises wicked plans and feet that make haste to run to evil. You notice those two words there. You got wicked and evil. Wicked and evil. Now, how do you picture a wicked and evil person? Like, do it in your head right now. I mean, how do you picture wicked? Like, if I picture wicked, I'm, I'm th- picturing like a dude with an ax covered in blood. <laughs> I mean, that's like a wicked, evil person. When God pictures a wicked, evil person, he doesn't picture a person standing there with an ax covered in blood. I'm sure that qualifies at some point, but... In this text, a wicked, evil person looks like this. That's it. Wicked, evil. Notice in verses 17 and 18, five body parts are mentioned. The reason five of them are mentioned because he's representing the whole entire person. Notice you've got uh, eyes, tongue, hands, heart, feet. What's he talking about? He's talking about the whole person is involved. What's the whole person doing? This whole person is doing what's called evil speech. Listen, there are seven things that God hates. Proverbs 6, 6 through 19. Four of the seven are evil speech. Four of the seven are open in your mouth to damage other people and run them down so that you can lift yourself up. The reality is that people are made in the image of God. And we have been given the power of speech and no other creature has. And our ability to speak can do incredible good and can do incredible damage. It all boils down to what kind of heart you have. I'm gonna give you a Bible verse right now. Look it up. This is for you. Memorize. I memorized this one probably 25 years ago. Luke 6, 45, Jesus Christ said, the good person out of the, is a good person. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good. 
the evil person, and they exist, out of the evil treasure of their heart, and they exist, brings forth that which is evil, and that exists. And Jesus says, Luke 6, 45, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We are either good or bad, good or evil, based on what we say, and it comes right out of our heart. Now, uh, you know, Aldous Huxley, the British philosopher and author, put it this way. He said, quote, thanks to words, we've been able to rise above the brutes. And thanks to words, we've been able to sink to the level of the demons. We hate it when others gossip about us. But we love it when they gossip to us. What is that? That is evil. Now, I just want to give you a little clue. This is a secret, so you can't go telling anybody, okay? You can't go gossiping this. Here it is. Here's a secret. Anyone who will gossip to you will gossip about you. Anybody who just feels free to run somebody down to you, guess what they're going to do about you to someone else? The same thing. I agree with Henry Thomas Buckle. He put it this way, quote, Great minds talk about ideas, average minds talk about events, but small minds talk about people. So many Christians, listen, I'm just trying to be honest with you. I watch it, I hear it, I see it, it flies right by. So many Christians are into gossip. God is not. It's far from not. Like if you're doing it, it explains everything. God hates gossip for two reasons. Number one, because gossip disgusts God. Number two, God hates gossip because gossip divides people. Gossip divides people. I'm curious, how many of you have had a relationship with a friend that you thought was a trusted friend, but they played you and they fooled you and you didn't find out till later on that they were not, in fact, a trusted friend? Can I see your hand? I had an experience like that. There was this person I got to know real well, like a trusted friend, always coming up to me saying stuff like, listen, dude, like these people over there were talking. So, so I'm over there and I'm hearing what they're saying about you. And so I look, I got your back. And so I always, like looking back, I discovered that my experience with this person always made me suspicious of everybody else. Because he was always telling me about how he's got my back here, there, there, there. And I'm like, wow, everybody must be out for me or something. Until he moved away. And then when he moved away, I realized he was talking out of both sides of his mouth. How many of you by show of hands know exactly what I'm talking about? Both sides of his mouth. He would be over there going, I don't know about Jim. He'd be over there going, I don't know about them. Back and forth. Back at this, what he did. And so many people totally okay with talking out of both sides of their mouth. Here's the question, though. How can you spot a person of trust? In a world like that, how can you? How can you spot? How can you be one? What does it look like? I heard a story about a monk who went to his leader, the abbot of the monastery, and he said, I'm troubled. I want to leave. And the monk, the old man, asked him why. And so the young monk said, I heard disturbing stories about one of the brothers. The old man said, are they true? The young monk said, yes, father. The one who told me is a man of trust. The old man looked at him and said, the one who told you is not a man of trust. If he were a man of trust, he would never have told you such things. Listen, how do I know if I'm a person of trust? How you handle someone else's reputation, that determines whether you're a person of trust or not. How you handle someone else's good name, how someone else is seen by other people, their reputation, the way you handle, the way I handle somebody else's reputation, that's what determines what kind of person I am. What does God hate? Proverbs 6 and verse 19. Here we go. God hates a false witness who breathes out lies and one who sows discord among brothers. Um, false witness, notice those two words, false witness. I feel like I've heard this before. False, I feel like I've seen those two words next to each other somewhere before. Now I remember, on a plaque called the Ten Commandments. Now I remember, the ninth one. 
Exodus chapter 20, verse 16, the ninth commandment. Thou shalt bear no false witness. Cannot bear false witness. You know, it's actually interesting because that command comes right after murder, adultery, and theft. Now listen, God places the prohibition, the ban against bearing a false witness about other people on the Ten Commandments. What does it say? Here's what it says. That placing another person's reputation as an important sacred thing is where God is coming from. God holds other people's reputations to be sacred. That's why the Ten Commandments has that right in there. Other people's name, other people's reputation must be protected. In fact, later on in the law, Deuteronomy 19, verses 18 and 19, say that a person who bears false witness in a court of law shall suffer the punishment that the other person was supposed to suffer. Wouldn't that be the best way to solve this? Like whatever damage you do by saying something about another person, you should get that damage. That would fix this. You humiliate somebody, you're humiliated. You run their name down, your name is down. We should put the stocks back out in the street and get people back out there. Because if we actually experience what we cause other people to experience, we would probably not do this. It was the 16th century reformer John Calvin, I think, called it out. He said this, quote, It is a sign. It is a sign of a perverse and treacherous disposition to wound the good name of another when he has no opportunity to defend himself. How evil must you be to ruin another human being's reputation without any opportunity on their part to even defend themselves? This is in the Ten Commandments. Sadly, though, many of us, we know, where we see this all the time. There are so many people who call themselves Christians who are absolutely okay with doing this. Totally good with running other people's reputations in the ground. What does God hate? God hates a false witness. Notice also, though, in verse 19, he hates one who sows discord among brothers. Those two words, sow discord, literally means to divide people. Now listen, telling gossip sows discord among people. But let me just give you a little shocker. Listening to gossip sows discord among people. Somebody one time defined gossip as confession of other people's sins. And for every talker, there's a listener. It's hard to get talkers to stop talking. Maybe we should focus on listeners. We should stop listening. There's an old saying that the receiver is as bad as a thief. Even in the law, our own law, a person who is in possession of stolen goods is just as guilty as the one who stole them. Listen, listening to gospel, gossip, <laughs> gossip is like receiving stolen property. You're an accessory. You're an accomplice. You're just as guilty as the one who did it. Remember now, there are six things that the Lord hates. Seven that are an abomination. The seventh is the worst. What's the seventh? It's the effect of it all. Sowing discord among brothers. So here's the question. Why does God hate gossip so much? Here's why. Because it's evil. Listen to me. Listen. If you don't get anything else I say, here it is. You're never more like the devil than when you gossip. Every time you gossip, you're being duped into doing the devil's job for him. Do you realize that Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19 are a portrait of the devil? Do you know this? They are. Let's run it down. Let's do the rundown. Here we go. We've got pride. We've got lies. We've got deception, accusations, and discord. If you got your pen, let's look at the job description of the devil. Jesus said in John 8, 44, he's the father of lies. There's one. Revelation 12, verse 9, he deceives the whole world. There's two. Revelation 12, verse 10, he's the accuser of God's people. There's three. And in Matthew, chapter 13, 38, he is the one who sows discord. We are never more, listen, God uses people. And so does the devil. Gossip is not okay. It's never okay. In our culture, totally cool. In scripture, Abomination. Literally. 
Seven things God hates. Pride, lies, bloodshed, guile, evil, false witness, division. Gee, now that we know what God hates, here's a question. What does God love? I don't know. Maybe the opposite? How about the opposite? How about, how about instead of pride, we have humility? How about lies? We have honesty. How about guile or evil? We have sanctity. How about false witnesses? We have fidelity. How about purity? Instead of division, how about harmony? Like, there's seven things that God hates, which means he loves the opposite. He loves humility and honesty and integrity and fidelity and harmony. This is what God loves. The question then becomes, when you're caught in this, and many of us, we know how this feels. I mean, it's, just, it's flying around all the time. How do you overcome what has become an acceptable sin? Gossip. How do you overcome? Well, I think it's actually quite simple. Instead of telling you, I'm just going to show you. I'm going to put up a little picture on the screen. Here it is. It's an old picture. It's called the Three Wise Monkeys, and it originated in 716 B.C. in Nippon, Japan, and it was created to teach children wisdom. All you need to know is right there. The three little monkeys, see no evil, speak no evil, hear no evil. Listen, if you're ever in doubt, like, I don't know what to do about all this. If you're ever in doubt, look, just be the monkey in the middle. If you're ever in doubt, just be the monkey in the middle. What's the monkey in the middle do? Speak no evil. How about this? I cover my mouth, you say speak no evil. Here we go. So if it's none of your business, if what you're going to say could hurt somebody's reputation, if you're not part of the solution, but see, that's hard. Maybe we should just step back one more step and make it a little easier. How about we all just focus on being the monkey on the right? Hear no evil. 16th century writer Joseph Hall put it this way, quote, There would not be so many open mouths if there were not so many open ears. Let's pray. Our Father, what do we say when we look into the scriptures and see that you hate things? That there are some things that cause disgust and contempt to arise within the heart of a loving, wise, heavenly Father. And so God, our, our response to this is that God, we don't even know what to make of it, but to say thank you, God, that you do in fact love us so much. That your invitation to us is to life, to become all that we were meant to become. And so our prayer today, God, is in this moment, in light of these truths, by the power of your spirit, enable us to adjust whatever we need to adjust so that we might be good children of our heavenly Father. With heads bowed and with eyes closed, there's some of you here today, maybe you're a Christian, you consider yourself one of God's people. Here's the question before you. Do you hate what God hates? Not in others, in you. Do you hate? There's some of you here today as a Christian truth is you have been hurt by other people's words. Somebody has said some things that's hurt your reputation and you have resentment and you have bitterness and you don't know what to do with it and it's just eating you alive. If you're here today and you're a Christian, I believe the Spirit of God is inviting you right here and now in a prayerful moment to give that resentment, to give that injury, to give that person over to God himself and say, God, you deal with them. Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. And then get on with becoming who God wants you to become. Don't let someone else's sin keep you from what God has for you. There are other Christians here today, the truth is, you're the one, You've, you're the one. You have opened your mouth and allowed evil to come out and harm someone else who bears the image of your Father in heaven. If you're here today and you're a Christian, your prayer is, God, I don't want to speak no evil. God, I don't even want to hear no evil. If that is your prayer, if that is your heart, if that is your commitment, raise your hand right here now because I want to pray for you. God, I pray for all my friends who are, who are just tapping into what your Spirit's saying right now. Say, I don't want to be a part of this. I don't want to have no part of that which you call an abomination. And so our prayer today, God, is by the power of your Spirit, fill us, fill us with your love, fill us with your grace, fill us with the ability and the power to cover up our ears and say, I am not listening to this. 
and enable us to be those people that Jesus spoke about out of the good treasure of our hearts, we would bring forth that which is good, thus revealing that we are, in fact, children of a loving, wise, heavenly Father. As we continue praying today, there some of you, you're here today, and the truth is God isn't your Father yet. You can't look to a moment in your life and you open your life and you submitted your life to Jesus and let, let just God be your king. And as a result, you're still on your own. You're the king of your life. And God brought you to this moment today so that you would know that he loves you and he hates everything that keeps you from him. That's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to the cross to, to take the barrier away that stands between you and God. That barrier is called sin. And on that cross, Christ took your sins upon himself so that when you commit yourself to him, you could become as him a son of God, a daughter of God, a beloved child of God. If you're here today and you sense that you're not right with God and maybe you're ready to be, you, you want to belong to God now and forever, it's as simple as A, B, C, A, admit that you're a sinner, you need a savior. And B, believe on Jesus, that he died on the cross for your sins and he rose from the grave to give you a new life and C, call upon him. Scripture says whoever calls on Jesus will be saved. That means forgiven. It means that God will put a spirit in your life. You belong to him both now and forever. He will never leave you, never forsake you and begin to make you into the person you were meant to become starting right here and right now. Now, if your prayer today is, Christ, I need you. Christ, I want you. Jesus, I submit my life to you. I want to belong to you. If that is your prayer, raise your hand right now. Just poke it up in the air. Say, that's me. That's my prayer. Christ, I need you. Christ, I want you. If that's you, lift your hand right now. Others around this room, lift your hand. If you're in the loft, if that's your prayer, lift your hand up. If you're sitting behind a computer alone, just raise your hand. Say, God, that's me. I'm reaching out to you. I want to belong to you. And you can be made right with God right here and now. You could just pray and say, dear God, I am a sinner and I need a Savior. And Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and you rose from the grave to give me new life. And right now I ask for you to forgive all my sins, to come into my life, to fill me with your spirit and to make me new. Thank you for forgiveness and thank you for new life. It is in Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, amen and amen. Let's celebrate with those who are calling on Christ today.